Then I went to the guy. Um, here's the couple of This is the first meeting, of, I mean, the first session of IEPF 92. I think it's important that I get this up and you know it says, if you know about any I, IPR, you're obligated to disclose. This was into the details. There's been an unbelievable amount of discussion about the content of this tape. So I'm just going to leave it up for five, ten seconds. You can read it for the, the new, the, the new improved version here. And if you don't mind, I'm going to work directly from the meeting materials. I think I've got the latest version of there, but you can write that up there. This draft, we actually got this draft, should have been published by now, RFP 7474. We came to very late in the cycle, actually uh, embarrassingly late. And uh, we decided amongst the authors that it didn't mesh with the spirit of the key chain draft. Key chain, that's my draft. The key table draft, or key table RFC, RFC 7210. So we edited that uh, section enough that we're going through another working group last call and I last call. That's going on right now. So if you want to, if you're at all interested in key tables, <coughs> that was a product of the carpool committee. You should take a look at it. Otherwise, the draft is largely on I mean, this RFC is largely on It's actually better to fix it. on RFC editor queue. We started out, this was done a lot. There was an auto config draft for CFC pretty long, long time ago. There was this zero comp working group. And it never went all the way to the end. We started out at for the home net requirement and started with this draft and continued to work on it even though due to the absence of a uh, open source for CFC3 implementation for accepted source test routing. It's not really a candidate on that, but this time moving all the way through to the end, we have all CFC3 auto config. And there were several, uh, Dave, David implemented it, and um, there were some other implementations. One, um, you can look in the draft to see which one escapes me right now. I think all these are close to. Uh, Working group group last call. The first two are enabling are enabling drafts. That's why it's uh, come on. Can you edit? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, they they're 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 working group. There's a lot of drafts depending on this one. Prefix link after this is the OSTF two version. So by enabling, this allows us to take OSTF extend it on an infinite, you know, by adding CLDs. The only bad thing about, I mean, it's not a bad thing, the only bad thing in this is you have a separate LSAs for the extension from the ones to base LSAs. So you've always got the chicken and egg, egg you know, you got to correlate the two together if you're doing anything uh, related to uh, SPF or anything related to the base, base prefix. So, I'd really like to get this get this working group last call. We have a few implementations. I think I know we have at least three implementations of this in OSTF. Probably another one. I know another one's underway, so it's 
single instance of LSA. I think it's not only a multi-engine, as one single TL, TLB, uh, for a capability exists so everybody doesn't have to find their own. The current capability of this image, because we are advertising all these capabilities that are in existence, we couldn't very well say that you use this to determine whether the protocol, you know, to implement protocol out, out, uh, operation. So rather than that, we, uh, the new, new, new TLB sets will allow you to influence protocol, uh, and the new TLB with the capability of this will allow you to influence protocol uh, operation based on the, the, whether the bid is set or bid. So I, I really want to get this in because there's a lot of, a lot of the drafts that are working with our teams are depending on being able to advertise um, a, a variable amount of information that may exceed one instance of the router capability uh, TLB. And finally, I think this advertising virtual image is created a challenge is a pretty straight, you know, pretty straightforward thing. The uh, ties to the routing working group manageability, I'll say a manageability graph to be able to identify uh, nodes. One real world, uh, one real use case in that graph is being able to identify routers that are eligible to use as targets for uh, remote access. Many of that things. I'm gonna have an update on some of this today. I'm not gonna say anything about it. First one, unfortunately or fortunately, it looks like we're going to have multiple ways to do this. So it looks like that. It's, it's kind of neurotic elaborate. At least in OCSP3. Not OCSP3, but OCSP3 already has a connection for router elaborate. You know, people have set up a LA. OCSP2 doesn't have that. And these are ones that we just Uh, informational or 
Hi, Chris Hobbs, Deutsche Telekom. Um, the choice to leave out the uh, the password, the clear test password, uh, might be ill advised. These are if it's this for me and I would, um, if the ISIS model, I'll probably complain. The clear password. You don't get four fingers to not. Yeah, we had actually. No, it was so. I, yeah, I'm thinking particularly just because recently been dragged into the home net stuff, right? Um, and just thinking about how home net the auto conf uses a specific clear text password. I, I don't know. I mean, there there could be reasons other than people wanting to use bad security to be able to configure that. Yes, yeah, just clear text. Okay. I think that's why we are here. We are here to for comments, right? So if you have any comments, we also actually had a big discussion on whether to include the the clear text or not, and decided not to have it for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We decided not to. Not to. Yeah, the choice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with that. I mean, just but have some way to configure it. Yeah, we can. Yeah, discuss about that. Just add another case in the choice. Uh, Lou Berger, have you given any thought on how your model might be augmented to support TE, or if that even makes sense? Uh, we actually have some basic T configuration here in the model. I missed that. Okay. Yeah, in the configuration part. Yeah, we do have the T feature. So I think there's some discussion as to whether or not um, the TE information is always going to be common with IS to IS, and if that's the case, does it belong in the protocol specific uh, model or does it belong somewhere else? And I'm not saying I have an answer. I'm just looking for your opinions on that. You know, is it better to define a basically a container that goes into both OSPF and ISIS, or just do it separately as part of the other TE models? You know, there's a lot of legacy here, and if you'll notice for Spring, the Stefan and uh, when we talked about it, we said, okay, let's throw this out there. For Spring, we did take that, as you'll see in the Spring work group, the other case. I think there's some other proposals to do that, so I'm really interested in yeah. your counter. You're arguing, you're arguing just what you're saying for spring now. We didn't consider it for TE because it's been around for more than a decade. So, but. Is there any yeah. information that you have that is beyond TE interface information? Um, right now, at Cisco's implementation, so we have everything. Um, you no, know, the OSPF part is just configured under OSPF, so that's why we have it. Are you it. configuring any router information or just interface information, TE information? In this data model, you mean? Yes. Yeah, in this data model, it's just T, uh, interface information. So, so where is, where, sorry, uh, but as a good example, where is the RFC 4203 or whatever it is, DMPLS, SRL, that's not in our model. No, that's not in our model. So in the um, TE, generic TE uh, models that are being developed, they already have interface um, configuration parameters, and it will probably have um, all the per interface information that you'll carry, and then that could be done both for IS to IS and OSPF. But the router information, if there's TE router information that you want to advertise, I think that's still open. Uh, that's not part of what I've seen so far. Uh, again, I don't think we have an answer. I think we have proposals at this stage. So it'll be good to sort of work that out. And the question is, is do you think that we should do something different for different sort of applications? Do you want Spring to be different, an answer for Spring to be different than the answer you do here for TE? You know, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know what the right answer is, so that's a question for the working group. Yeah. And I, I, 
I guess also for the ISIS working group. Yeah, I think we will have to work together with the TE draft in order to make a you know, better draft. Make a. No, yeah, for the, the, the one in our draft, we don't have very much. Yeah, I went looking much for SRLG, quite honestly, and I didn't find it, so I missed the other. But I, I do hope we have the same answer for OSPF and ISIS, though. Yeah, the problem with T is the implementation has been there for years, so different weathers have different flavors. It's hard to uniform. Not like uh, spring is like a new draft, so it's easier to uni unify it. Isn't that statement true for any of these Yang models? <laughs> yeah, correct. So you know it's hard. <laughs> there's, there's one other next step we're trying to do, I, I, and I'm going to talk to them, uh, uh, the um, members of the Open Seas Space, and they have a lot of models too. At least for ISIS and Open Force PF, the hope is that uh, since we've worked on this for more than a year with I mean, they didn't all sit on us, but there's probably five or six vendors of who have reviewed it and one, op and one operator. So hopefully we can get them to, I know we don't agree on, I mean, I, I won't say we don't agree. We have different models for some of the things, BGP, for example. But it'd be nice to say, you know, before you, you know, take a look at this and tell us what you think for open the So I think it's, I think we got the right answer. Especially once we decide on uh, the, uh, Protocol versus growth sensing, and I think that's going to happen this week. A lot of those people who have come with us, this is parallel to the next time working group is happening. Uh, sorry. This is Uma from Ericsson. So I'm going to talk about uh, OSPF operator defined TLVs for agile service deployment. Uh, this has been presented in uh, IETF 91 in Honolulu. The name of the draft earlier incarnation was self-defined TLVs, and we have got a lot of questions that what is self-defined? Uh, what is self really means? Is it the user, router, operator? So we renamed the draft as uh, operator defined TLVs. And I want to present the same thing here. Next slide, please. So why do we need this? We have a, uh, recently we have seen the draft in OSPF and ISS, uh, node admin tags, which is a great draft, which enables a lot of use cases, and especially one of the use cases is uh, service deployment, uh, a service auto discovery, actually. So you can quickly identify the services in the network uh, but where it stops, it just identifies the tag. But uh, for a lot of services, apart from the uh, identifier, you need to have uh, you need to you need to have the extra information. Let's say, for example, a label. So here, this uh, this draft actually basically what it does is uh, it allows operator to configure services and the service attributes 
uh, in a easy fashion and that can be uh, given to a controller, a centralized controller where it can take a lot of decisions. So it also it also enables us uh, enables the operator for uh, for example, for example, these policies can be dynamic. For example, a backup service can be installed, or a load balancing instance can be created on the fly. So the attributes corresponding to that then can be flooded and then given to the controller easily. And another use case for this is uh, nodes critical information like energy efficiency and that kind of critical information can be passed to the controller. And how this con how controller use this for this information is out of the scope of this document. Next slide, please. So what it does is uh, it creates a structure for this to advertise this information, which is driven through policy, local policy. Uh, what we are requesting in this draft is basically assign a uh, type from ANA registry from the RITLV registry as defined in RFC 4970. And the flooding scale depends on the application. It can be link, area, or domain. Next slide, please. <coughs> so it has sub-TLVs. As we see that the container TLV, it has sub-TLVs. So it enables us, uh, it enables operator to pack multiple attributes for one type. Let's say this type here is the operator provision type. There was a discussion last time that uh, the, some of the types can be should be reserved. That is, like it should be allowed for operator some range and some some to be for future use. Uh, Alia suggested that, so we are uh, we are we have to actually have in, initiate the discussion on that. But we have an offline discussion on that. So the type can be basically in this draft is for per local policy, and it's operator provision type, and it can it can have multiple attributes or single attribute. The attribute length represents the attribute value, and the attribute value is encoded in the network byte order. If multiple fixed length values have to be presented, it should be represented with multiple tuples, or it can have another type. Next slide. So these are the properties. Uh, it's much explained better in the draft, but as a summary is, it is totally opaque to SPF, and. Uh, so the router may not be supporting it, but still it can uh, transparently pass through this information. This is a deployment specific TLV. And how receiving node communicates to the ODS of TLVs with the policy manager outside the scope of this memo. Next slide. So there was a uh, last time when we got a few uh, feedback from a uh, couple of folks here, uh, usage of separate instance. So it's again, it depends. Uh, if, the, if the information being passed through this DLV by operator is pertaining to the routing, which impacts routing, it can be used, it can be used in the same routing instance. If it, if, it is, if it is not corresponding to the routing instance, it can be used in a different instance. OSPF transport instance can be used, for example. Next slide. So we want to acknowledge a couple of folks here. Uh, Louis from Verizon, uh, he had interesting uh, use cases for this. Uh, we're still uh, discussing his use cases and reviewing it. Uh, we thank Chris from Juniper for reviewing and giving valuable feedback and also suggesting a name for this, which is acceptable, probably. And uh, for the earlier incarnation of the draft, we thank AC, Les, and Peter for a lot of feedback and offline discussions. So we guess we took a lot of feedback here, and uh, others feel that it's uh, ready for working group adoption. Probably we can ask in the working group. But I would like to ask, uh, take some questions here. How many people have read? Right. Uh, that really should be standardized. Yeah. Um, so, for that second, I don't, I don't know how well I do. I'm struggling. I just apologize. I didn't read this again or until last night. And, but I struggled with the use case. And I came up with one. I came up with one. If you have an infrastructure where you can um, have operators install their application, you know, and people are starting to add more programmability started once way, way back, I don't remember 
that's going to do something. We, we don't, what we don't want to do is just give some, just push the problem of standardization one layer lower from the TLD to the sub TLDs. Because then you, you know if you have people, you know, vendor X advertising one set of TLDs and vendor Y advertising another, it's not it's not going to work. But if, if we have some way to you envision an infrastructure where uh, people can install their applications and allow us to collect the data, then, then it makes sense. So yeah, I agree with you. This is one of the reasons Alia talked about uh, reserving some space in the types which can be future standardization. For example, energy efficiency or some other critical parameter which can be uniformly understood probably. So that's one of the reasons we were just contemplating on that. Probably we can take your feedback offline on this. Perfect. <coughs> yeah, I, I guess um, the AC's concern is sort of the general concern of, okay, you've sort of opened up this little hole, but you can actually potentially drive a truck through this hole, and it's now a non-standardized truck. And so this is useful for, I, I see, reasonable use cases, but it's perhaps in the draft you should address the concerns about it being a truck-sized hole and what the appropriate uses of this hole are, as opposed to sort of leaving it open to the imagination. Yeah, definitely I agree with Chris, and uh, this is the same point, basically. So we have to reserve some of the types and the subtypes, basically, so, uh, so that we can, in future, somebody can define a parameter which is acceptable and which can be enhanced so that each node can understand the same thing and can have interoperation, basically.
doing a checking the tag based on the next stop or something like that, if you have ESC, you could possibly set up multiple, multiple, multiple tags. Or if you're propagating a tag across an area boundary, you know, going from an uh, intra to inter area or drought, that that yeah. EMC. So you may take take may take more than one of these tags from your, your constituent routes. Again, you should propagate on area the tags should be propagated at area boundaries. Generally the way implementation do this is for the routes to go into the local rib, you keep track of one or more tags. And then those are the things that get propagated. So if you get a same with inner area, if you have an NSA translation to an external route by an ADR, you propagate the middle. And again, for, for area ranges, uh, of course, you're not going to propagate the tag because you can have more than one constituent stuff routes. There's a case at NSA that I think was a mistake, but uh, where they special case this. I'm not going to say anything about that. That's the case, I guess I know. That's the case where in the NSA draft, it says that if you have a range and you have a route that matches the range exactly, it allows you, the route, to not be part of, not be a contributor to the range, but be advertised as other range. I think that would be some complexity in NSA. So. If somebody wants to do that, they can do that with the key tags as well. So you normally you configure you configure your tags for ranges, either NSA or uh, area ranges, or for redistribution, you configure redistribution policy, etc. Et now the ISIS graph, this is way, way back, seven years ago, and, and it was in use more than seven years ago, trying to took it took another two years to standardize the size. So more like ten years. There was a 64 bit tag. Nobody's implemented this. Nobody's used it. The use case of, of, of putting carrying BGP extended community is not really, nobody's putting a lot of BGP routes in, in, in the IEP. So I left that out. I just moved the 64 bit tag to uh, appendix because I, 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 I couldn't find one standard that implemented it for ISS. Any I like 5130 a lot, and uh, I have seen customers using it in a lot of use cases, Ericsson customers. Uh, and for your statement where BGP routes into IGP, and for this use case for this is, think about entry area option C, where BGP need to be redistributed into both LGP and, uh, LDP and I, uh, IGP. So there are some cases. I never see this, uh, but probably there might be some cases.
Hello? Yeah, okay, yeah. This, is, this is better, okay. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, OSPFT TDZ. So first I'll go into introduction and then mostly focus on the extension to OSPF. Next, next slide. So basically we just uh, virtualize a, a cloud into uh, ages fully connected from traffic engineer's point of view. So after we virtualize this cloud, and then we will see just ages of this cloud fully connected from traffic engineer's point of view. So here we have a link. This link will have the maximum bandwidth, which is the pass of maximum bandwidth pass, the maximum bandwidth of the maximum bandwidth pass. So after virtualization, so from on any node outside of this uh, TDZ, we just see this topology, virtualized topology. So for every node inside the TDZ, so it will see the whole topology, the topology inside TDZ and the outside, outside of uh, the, the nodes or the, and the links. So, ne so next, next page. So there are a couple of ways to virtualize, uh, to uh, make an extension to protocol to virtualize uh, the TTZ from tra traffic engineer's point of view. So one way is that we just add some TLVs for TTZ into existing traffic engineer LSAs. So here for an OPEC LSA, for TLSA, so we have existing route address TLV, we have link TLV here, we just add another TDZ ID TLVs into existing TL, TLSA. So we, optionally, we may add another L, uh, TLVs for TDZ. So next page. So for TDZ ID TLV, we just have uh, TDZ IDs within this uh, uh, TLV. So this is already defined in the OSPF TDZ draft. So another one is a TDZ optional TLV. This is also defined in the OSPF TDZ draft. We only uh, introduce another bit, uh, virtualized bit. This is uh, optional. So next page. So with this option, so we just go through details to see uh, when we migrate a cloud to TDZ. So first we configure uh, TDZ within this cloud. So after the configuration, we can trigger the distribution of TDZ information. Here, the, uh, TDZ information, we just uh, add a TDZ ID into existing uh, TELSAs. So when we, so each node inside the TDZ will distribute the t, uh, TLSA with uh, this additional TLV. So for any node outside, because this uh, TLV will be ignored because this is new, he doesn't care, he, he doesn't know, so he just ignored. So, so from this point of view, so it's, it's okay. But inside TDZ, it will know because he is, is a TDZ aware. So next page. So after we distribute uh, TDZ information and then we migrate to work as a TDZ for this whole cloud. So the age, the age node, uh, in, so the age node will generate TLSAs for virtualize the TDZ, just for virtualize the, those kind of uh, uh, T links between the age node to age node. So this uh, uh, TLSA for virtualized TDZ is uh, just a normal TLSAs. So it will virtualize this link. So this uh, TLSA will distribute to outside. So I just outside will see those kind of uh, Ages fully connected for uh, with T uh, T uh, links, but this one because we use the existing T L C, so age out or flush out those L C is, is uh, maybe takes time. So only after maybe some time, and then we have clear pictures. Next page. So after some time, maybe half hour, one hour, so maximum. So we have we we have clear pictures of traffic engineer topology for outside node, and for inside node is okay because he knows the TE. 
So that's the uh, first uh, option for uh, virtualized uh, PE, TDZ. So next page. So another way is that we use another LSA so to wrap up those uh, TLSA, uh, TE informations. So we already defined a, a new type, TDZ LSA type, and here we just introduce another type for TDZ TE LSAs. So this LSA will contain the existing information in the TE LSA, and then we just add one more information, TDZ ID TLV. So this method will be uh, is easily and also work very clear, so we'll see details in the next slides to see what happens when we do the migration to the TDZ. Next page. So first we configure the TDZ in this cloud, and then we distribute TDZ information using another LSA. So this TLS LSA will distribute with just within this uh, cloud, because after configuration, those edges will know this TDZ LSA, so it will just uh, not distribute this information to our site. So after distributing this uh, TDZ information, and then we can do the migration. So edge node will originate the TLSAs for virtualize those kind of uh, edge to edge TE links. So, and then we can flush out those TLSAs for the link inside TDZ right away. So next page. So after migration, we can almost immediately have a clear picture from outside. Every node outside will see this topology, and then this uh, TDZ is virtualized. So inside the TDZ, we have uh, the, the whole picture of, of the network. So next page. So this uh, is the algorithm of how to uh, figure out the maximum bandwidth between uh, among the age, uh, age, age routers. So basically, this is just SPF. Find the maximum path from age to age. So we just use a, uh, just change the existing SPF to find the maximum bandwidth path, and then that's all among the age to ages. So next page. Would you guys, just one question on this that, that I wasn't sure of. Would you take any path, or would you say, oh, only the best path? On uh, any path. This any is path. yeah. This is uh, any path. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, next page. Yes, yes. Can we sell the mic? Yeah, we can sell the mic. Come, come from. Yeah, yes, we can sell the mic. Uh, Rajan, so my question is on. Uh, I think you are trying to advertise T1, T3 outside of your transparent zone, right? So what is the bandwidth you're going to address? Yeah, that's the uh, bandwidth is a uh, kind of algorithm to so find the maximum bandwidth path from T3, uh, T4 to T3. But you have multiple links. Yeah, yeah. So for example, on this node, we'll find the maximum bandwidth from T1 to T10, from T1 to T3, and then from T1 to T4. So that's equal to the smallest link that you have along the path. Like, for example, T, if I have 10 gig here, 100, 100, so maximum bandwidth you're going to realize is 10 gig. No, no, that, that's a, we just search the, search the network. So we, from here, we search the network, find the maximum bandwidth path. So this is just like a, we find the shortest path. And then we, we, as soon as we find the shortest path, we have uh, uh, the course for that sort of path. So here, we just find the maximum bandwidth path. So as soon as we find the maximum bandwidth path, then 
the bandwidth for that maximum bandwidth path is the maximum bandwidth. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I'm Hannes with Juniper. Uh, going back one slide to the maximum bandwidth calculation. Um, yeah, not to the illustration. One, one further to the illustration. Okay, so so how how does the algorithm here work? Um, you know, when you usually do those kind of abstraction things. Uh, Usually, uh, you go and search for the shortest path tree and then extract the minimum link bandwidth on that shortest path tree. So why didn't you pick that method? Just curious. So you, okay, uh, but then you're overselling a bit, right? Uh, okay, okay. So you're essentially giving a promise that you cannot really hell hold when somebody wants to signal a LSP through. And m m my suggestion would be to be a little bit more on the conservative side here. Thank you. Hi, uh, <coughs> Blue Burger process question. Uh, we have, and this may be more for AC or NAD, who's sort of in the room, half in the room, for the next couple of days. Um, you have also a TTZ in, uh, uh, for RSVP and T's. Right. Does it make sense to do these things together? Um, if so, we can do it in T's and just keep OSPF working group in the loop, or do you want to do it separately? And it's, I have to say, I, I have... I haven't wrapped my head around this of how it would really work in practice, if it really works in practice, um, but I, I think the work has to go together. So the question is, how do you want to run it? And I'm okay with either, so I mean, I'm really just asking an opinion of the chair as well as the author. Yeah, I think, you know, the EMPLS stuff is, is definitely in the work that nobody understood it, but uh, I mean, no, nobody wanted to understand all the yeah. Yeah, um, so, I well, I'm responding, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, as a as uh, an AD, still um, the bits and bytes of the protocol stuff, I think, is fine to have wherever the chairs decide it, and that sounds like OSPF. I am worried about the architectural piece of this, the traffic engineering architectural piece. Um, so, some of the questions that Hannes was asking asking about how do you actually run that algorithm and is that the right algorithm? Uh, is that algorithm, does it have to be a network-wide thing? Um, is there, what are the policy points here? That stuff, that discussion needs to happen in, in the T's working group. I, I, it covers RSVP. I don't remember it covering uh, computation. So just a synchronous point of view in PE. Just how we set our path and then we consider TTZ. I thought it also needed, uh, this is uh, a question why is it better than switching? Uh, yeah, good question. I think uh, uh, why can they make it in the uh, Yeah, yeah. So because this one, uh, this is just one, if we have multiple areas, 
So this is some kind of a, we can provide an automatic way to set up LSP across the TDZ as some kind of a region. So if we have uh, multiple areas, we we need to manually configure or we use a PCE. And then PCE is uh, some kind of, uh, I think is a, we need more configuration there, just more configuration or, more, or we can stay some kind of communicate. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, there's much more adjustment to using this graph than there is aggregate data. And that's why I'm more expensive. So, Sorry, Mark? Are you still alive, Mark? Take this one. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Shadda, uh, presenting the OSPF link overload. Uh, this is a new draft, 00 version of the draft, uh, submitted lately. Um, so uh, the, uh, we have the stub router advertisement in OSPF, which talks about um, uh, uh, the router going into maintenance and then um, moving the traffic around the router that goes for maintenance. So this, this, this talks about a similar idea for the overlay networks. Uh, next. next. So uh, we have a typical overlay network diagram here. Uh, so um, the C's uh, we'll see uh, we'll not see the P routers, they just see it as an overlay network and OSPF runs on top of the C to uh, C blue 1 to C blue 2 link. So the uh, underlying network devices are not visible. So when the underlying network devices go for maintenance, uh, we need a way to, uh, uh, similar to the uh, overload functionality, to move the traffic around the uh, router that goes for maintenance to other links, even before, before the router goes for maintenance. Um, so we have a way to do that uh, uh, if, if P1 is going for maintenance. So, so we have mechanisms wherein we can, P1 can inform C blue 1 to, uh, that it's going for maintenance and then move the traffic uh, away from P1 towards P2. But the similar uh, uh, facility is not available for C blue 2. So there's no way to inform C blue 2 that P1 is going for maintenance. So uh, C blue 2 will continue to uh, send the traffic over the same link. Um, uh, so it's not very easy to move the traffic from the remote end to another link. Go next slide. Uh, so so if, if, if we need to, uh, you know, operators find it very difficult to configure manually on every node, uh, every remote end, uh, to divert the traffic when P's go for maintenance or they go for upgradation. So the, uh, so the motivation is to uh, get an automated way to, uh, uh, during maintenance, to move the traffic away from the uh, links that go for maintenance. Next slide. Next slide. This is another example so, uh, wherein uh, the overlay networks could be uh, implemented on top of broadcast um, networks over IRB interface. Uh, it's just another use case, another way where, uh, how you deploy overlay networks. So the motivation for the draft is uh, ease of maintenance, automated upgradation, and minimize traffic loss so that uh, when you know the router is going for maintenance, you move the traffic away from the node and then verify everything is fine and then go for maintenance. Uh, so the way we want to achieve this is to advertise a link overload TLV uh, in uh, 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 rather sub TLV in extended link opaque LSA. So um, prefix link attributes uh, uh, gives a way of 
uh, defining the um, extended link opaque LSA wherein you could uh, carry uh, attributes of the link. So there is an extended link TLV. So this link overload TLV would go as a uh, sub TLV of the extended link TLV. So it identifies that the link is in overload state. So the remote end identifies the connecting link and then it increases the metric of that link to max metric and then, then refloods the router LSA. So um, because the link uh, metric is increased, traffic is diverted away from the overloaded link to alternate link and then uh, so the overlay link is ready for maintenance. Um, this is a solution for P2P links. Uh, so the broadcast links, um, uh, we will not be able to increase the metric to max metric because um, we just want to divert the traffic that is going towards the uh, uh, overlay link which is going for maintenance and not to all of your neighbors. So the way to achieve this is to um, advertise link overlay load TLV in extended link opaque LSA and then DR of the link recognizes the new TLV. It removes the TLV originating router from the list of connected neighbors in the network LSA and then refloods the network LSA. So, uh, so the traffic is diverted away from that overloaded link and then it takes the another path. So, and then the overlay link is ready for maintenance. Uh, so the uh, sub-TLV details. Uh, so this TLV is carried in the extended, uh, as a sub-TLV of extended link TLV. Uh, it has the type, length, and the remote IP address. So the remote IP address is needed to identify um, uh, the link when there are uh, multiple parallel links connecting two nodes uh, because the extended link TLV just has the link ID and link data. Uh, so if, if there are multiple parallel links uh, with that information, you may not be able to distinguish which exact link is going for maintenance. So uh, we have the remote IP address also along with this. Uh, so um, uh, for IPv, I mean OSPF v3, uh, I think it's missing in the uh, presentation. So we uh, we have a um, link overload TLV specifically for OSPF v3, which is carried in extended uh, router LSA in the router as a sub TLV of router link TLV. Uh, so so the format is similar. Only thing you you just need the type and length, and you don't need the um, IP address um, identifying because the TLV already defines the uh, uh, the forward and the um, neighbor's interface ID. So questions and comments? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you have the path path and you can say that another path. Yeah, alternate path, yes. So the implementation of the matching switch to the to set up that link, set up the path link path. You don't use that, right? Yeah, it's right. Uh, so the uh, reason for max metric is, see, it's easy to set a max metric on this side where P1 goes for maintenance to do it on CE blue 1. You could have different ways of doing it. But the problem is CE blue 2 won't come to know that this link is going for maintenance. So that's that's the reason we are having the new TLV. Yes, CE, CE it's, it's an overlay network. So OSPF is running between CE blue 1 and CE blue 2. So CE blue 2 is supposed to um, uh, uh, it should understand this TLV. So if it does not understand, it simply ignores. So you don't have this mechanism, but there's no uh, looping or anything. But then CEBLU2 increases the metric and refloods, which everybody understands. So there, there still won't be any loops in case somebody else behind the network doesn't understand this TLV. So, so this is the one yes. 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 Yeah. I think it's there in the draft. No, 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 there's no negotiation. Um, I think it may not be required because in case the other side doesn't understand, there's, 
I mean, the feature doesn't work, but it, there's no adverse effect, right? So. I mean, I mean, I can see any, I can see any, any, any need to assume a chain is a block that is going in both directions, and you can just take it out of service. And in fact, that's what you do in the broadcast system: take it out of service, rather than rather than having the So, so, so uh, generally, the uh, operators. So operators use it for, you know, they they want to be sure. Uh, that the uh, traffic is diverted only then want to take take the router out for maintenance. So you don't take the router out of service. You just you just as part of the procedural you just sort of draw the advertising because of the bidirectional step, the traffic is diverted. You just don't advertise that. Uh, so so if you if you just don't advertise it then it's similar to just taking it out, right? I mean you, why well, you, you you still So uh, you know it's it's very similar uh, to uh, taking da uh, taking the link link down and then when the link goes down anyway uh, uh, you know the other end would be informed and then taking them but that will have transient traffic loss right no. so uh, I mean it will, it will it will depend on micro but it's still yeah you no because uh, this this will not have transient traffic loss because um, even if, you know, because of the delays, uh, e even if the other end is still sending the traffic, you have the link up, so you still... Uh, I'm, saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying not going the link down when the link goes down. Right. 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 Right.
So, AC. So in the sorry in the in the past there was a reverse metric draft in RSI, and one of the motivations for that allegedly was you wanted to leave the path as the path of last resort and not to take it down. I don't know if you have the same motivation. This draft, this draft is about advertising and capitalization capital to the US here. Uh, this is, yeah, next slide, please. So the use cases for this is, uh, uh, the three use cases predominantly. First is increments and deployment use case, where a, a string topology in the string topology, uh, you might have a network where all the nodes are string capable, not all string capable, and also not all are MTS, MTLS capable. For example, uh, for the new deployments, where you want to deploy uh, a string and a string capable deploy only on the edge nodes, so then uh, the immediate neighbor will not be string capable, so you will not have label with that neighbor. So, so to your, your next, next segment will be uh, multiple hops away. So to tunnel this, uh, Traffic, the remote node, which is string capable, can advertise the uh, encapsulation capability and the associated parameters. So the node here can automatically encapsulate the packets and send it to this. So this is basically incremental deployment use case. The same thing can happen for B, B router, where all the nodes are not B capable, and you want to encapsulate the packets, B packets, and send it to the node where B, uh, B capabilities are there. For, for non-string and MTLS deployments where uh, string child is interoperable to create a distinct entry point, but this is for non-MTLS and non-string capable. Uh, the second case is non-MTLS based remote access, where 
once the PC node is connected, uh, it's, it's non, non MPLS based, obviously. So the nodes uh, tunneling capabilities need to be applied. So, the first thing is the remote node. Uh, the remote node, which is establishing tunnel to the PC node to deliver the traffic to the eventual destination, can use that uh, tunnel and the associated parameters to dynamically establish this node. So the ingress of IP based tunnel nodes to some part was high, supported by the address IP node equally, and also the parameters. So uh, the uh, this, this task talks about the encapsulation capital by the uh, address IP by the remote node, and uh, the types of encapsulation listed are MPLS and IP, MPLS and GRE, MPLS and LTP, and MPLS and IP and IP node to efficient traffic. So the, uh, the PC node uh, non-MPLS based uh, remote LFPKS is brought up as demo. So we didn't have the text set in the document, so but we want to present it here so that we have uh, some feedback here. So the document update need to be done as the RLFPKS and the encapsulation type to cover source. So the, the current draft only talks about uh, encapsulating MPLS packets, but uh, this can be updated if you write here. So also, there are cases where the encapsulation, apart from the encapsulation type from the remote node, you got to advertise the parameter associated with encapsulation. For example, IP address keys for the encapsulation or a GRE key in some cases. So these also need to be worked out clearly in the draft. So we want to present this early and we want to get some feedback from the community. This is the information that you're like to listen to and store and process. What, you, what, what good would that do to me as a remote node? As a remote node, when you receive that information, you have some local configuration, and you know that there's remote node capabilities, and you pick according to the local configuration you pick, or it depends on the, or it can, may not have local configuration. As purely uh, advertised by the remote node, you establish the tunnel using that type, encapsulation type. So, if I understand the graph correctly, the head end of the tunnel will tell everybody that it can push MPLS into an IP tunnel and place the remote node. No, 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 no. The head end of the node will understand from the remote node's advertisement that this is the what, what what I should be doing to successfully deliver to the remote end, actually. So you are advertising the tunnel to a remote node. You are, you are saying I can, I can deliver the MPLS packet to a remote node X, right? No, 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 no. Remote, you, you, are the, you are the one who are sending the packets to me, spring packet to me, okay. and your next stop is not spring capable. So the remote node, which is the next segment in the spring, is advertising that I have an MPLS in GRE capability. So I advertise it to you, so you immediately understand that this guy can understand and you put a tunnel to me and send it uh, and capture the packets. Wouldn't this be more of a policy kind of thing? Something like a green pack saying, use these nodes for this, rather but, than advertising capability? But admin tag doesn't specify what uh, what is this. Uh, there are various encapsulation possible, right?
So, I, I, for example, I'll take up the remote LFA case, probably it can understand. The PQ node, you, you did all the hard work, you did find the PQ node. All the P-space nodes need to know this PQ node, right? PQ node and encapsulation, then only you can encapsulate. So, by advertising, before, beforehand you don't know what is the PQ node. So, but PQ node, if advertises that I can capable of IP and IP tunnel, so all the P-space nodes, which is establishing the tunnel, can easily establish the tunnel. That's the use case. That's the simplest use case where I can, can get you. No, you are, you are specifying the remote node capabilities all over because you don't know who, who's going to use that in the IGP area. So, for example, admin tag, for, it's the same thing, right? Uh, you cannot describe all the things using the admin tags and also the associated parameters, right? Let's say you have a PQ node, have multiple nodes, multiple IP addresses. So it says that IP and IP are GR, you can associate the parameter with that. Yeah. Sure, you can, uh, I can talk to offline probably. So, so, it's easy. Uh, so I think the, the kind of shaky part of it now when I'm thinking about it is a situation where there will be not universal deployment of MPLS for Spring, right? Right, right. Right, because, because, because if the assumption is that everybody supports, you don't need everybody supports Spring, you don't need this. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is for... So that's, that's the question of the use case it is... I think for MPLS, MPLS, just MPLS alone, I think you need to describe why you need to use it. That's, that's what, you know, why. So there is a, uh, a draft in Spring, which I is know. the Spring Island connectivity, which yeah. describes the use case clearly. Yeah. So Bruno wants that to expand to non-MPLS cases, non-Spring cases. You want to generalize it with it, but we can okay. find text for that. Okay. I mean, I think if it, if it gets accepted by Spring, it makes sense, sure. especially. Okay. Aircom? Everybody uh, sign in the sheets. So we'll discuss, I mean, you want to, you subscribe to what you have to? Well, I, to be honest, I read the whole entire size version of it. I'll just put this way. It's the same thing. Yes, it's the same thing. I read the entire size version of it. Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Again, I just wanted to advertise that we're discussing routing and big infrastructure which all the all the, all the protocol and the policy case the protocol and projects are plugging into in the NetCon work group tomorrow at nine o'clock. And then again on Thursday at one o'clock in the routing the second session of the routing uh fourth year. This this last presentation wasn't on your agenda. What which draft was it? It was encapsulated. Oh okay. Well, you, we shifted it from somewhere else on the event? What? Did you shift it from somewhere else on the event? The last thing on your agenda on the website is, is the one with the Chandra. Oh, you were not there. Yeah. I sometimes you know where they were in. We don't have the same materials. Ah. Okay. Nobody can play, but until you pointed it out. It must not be one of the draft Shindorians. It's probably uh, Bruno's Agarius. Okay, thanks.